I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Peace and, and, and blessings, everyone. It's so it's so good to be here. Um, I tell you, it's, it's I know you guys probably think this woman is always smiling, but it's like each week it gets better and better. And this is going to be great because this is one of my um, well, actually, now this is like two of my really cool cool dudes right here. We're about to sit down and have a conversation with. Uh, but before we get started, just regular old housekeeping. You guys know what I'm about to say. First, let me just first give a shout out, though, to um, everyone in the chat. Oh, yo, Donnell People's already started. He, he's already started. Thank you for uh, donating to Hoppy. Let me tell you what when, when you guys donate, what it does. It allows us to not only bring this programming, but to um, be able to pay people um, that look like us to do more work in our community. OK, and we keep the money that you give to us. Um, it circulates within within the family. Um, so it's really important that you guys, um, you know, contribute anything that you can. And if you know, listen, I understand COVID times. I understand people not having money. But what you and what everyone, hopefully everyone does have is a finger. And all you have to do is like this video. So let's like the video, everyone, and sh and and send it to three other people, because everything is is you know like the, the magic number is three. That's what Jabari Ozazi said. The magic number is three. So everyone has to um, you know, um, they, they, you guys have to send this to at least three other people, and uh, and then subscribe to our channel. And so let me just put some little information up here so everybody knows. Um, our our cash app is just Happy Film, Happy Film right there. Um, but this is what we need for everyone to do. If you have not seen Happy, which has thirty scholars, including one that's here tonight, it has thirty scholars drop in all types of jewels. You've got to go to our website which is hoppyfilm.com. Now, when you're there, you can get additional copies. You can see it like as soon as we're done with this, you can go ahead and get the digital copy and see Hoppy tonight. Or if you want to, you know, you have a library of DVDs like me, you might want to just go ahead and um, and get your, um, you know, get your DVD copy or do both. Um, also, while you're at the web, um, on the website, we need for you to sign up for the newsletter. OK, the newsletter is um, a way that we can communicate with um, with everyone and share really good information. And we can really get into some intricacies of a lot of different things. For instance, we have um, we've linked a deal with Appeal Credit Union. You know, they were on a couple of uh, weeks ago. And so they are supplying us with financial one on one news. And the article this month is about susus, like what is a susu and how that, you know, this has been part of who we, you know, who we are like forever. So you got to check out the newsletter. But we have financial one on one news. And we also talk about a financial innovator. So someone in the past that has laid the pathway for us to be you know, where we are now. We talk about them. We also have a health article um, and we have a boot shot from the Shrine of Mayat. She writes this health, um, you know, piece, which is great. She has a little recipe in there. It's like a, a little morning jolt um, of herbs. So you got you to gotta check out hers. And then we also always, always, always do a happy update to let you know, like, oh, we're going to be in this theater or we're doing this or whatever we're doing with Hoppy. And then we always, always support black businesses and we salute a black business or sometimes a few every, um, you know, every newsletter. And I saw, um, unless my eyes are mistaken, the person that we actually saluted this this time, which was Black Silt yoga out of Atlanta, Georgia. 
Oh my God, it's this couple. Yes, I see them in the um, chat. It's this couple that uh, they have created like this oasis of comedic yoga. So it's, I mean, just like looking through the page, looking through their pictures on their page is beautiful. So you got to check this newsletter out so you can get connected to them. They do online. So you don't have to be in Atlanta to, you know, to get into this yoga position. So you want to check out that, um, you know, definitely check out the newsletter. So, it, but you can only get on the newsletter if you sign up. So you got to go to hoppyfam.com, sign up for the newsletter, get your copy of Hoppy. It's very important. And then we hold, we also have gear. We have all types of gear. We have the DVDs. Uh, Taki has actually done two other films before Hoppy. So those are on there. That's Nubian and Tekken. And we have um, t-shirts and, um, and posters. So please, you know, Check us out on hoppyfilm.com. All right. I want to um, also give a, a um, go ahead, George Ames. I think George was just on, on the live um, with us on, um, on Instagram, myself and Chase. So that's what's up. Okay, George, I see you representing. Um, thank you very much. Okay. All right. So these, these two brothers. So first I'm going to start. I'm going to start with the young brother first. Okay. This guy, Chase. So let me just tell you a story about Chase. I had been, um, he posts these things on IG where he has clips of all different uh, like videos and just to be a snippet enough to get you like, yeah, yeah, you know, and he puts them up on um, IG. So I had been following him for like, you know, maybe two or three months prior. So then I reached out to him because I was like, yo, where is this brother at? I'm like, we need to, we need to link up with him. So we started talking and he's like, well, I'm from Atlanta. I was like, oh my God, because he would always post these IG clips of people that were in our film. And, you know, and sometimes like when we do a happy talks, he would take a little piece and put it up there. So I was like, oh, my God, like, who is this brother? So I'm talking to him and he's like, you know, telling me his age. And I'm, I'm not going to go around telling people's ages, but he's half of my age and I'm 50. OK, so so I'm not saying his age, but this young brother. And then I started talking to him. He's like, oh, I, I write books. I was like, you write books? I was like, oh, my God. And so I went onto his website. And lo and behold, I have, I mean, he, this brother's writing books, but this is the thing. He was very humble and he was like, what do you guys need? I'm here to support you. And that's what I'm talking about when it comes to black power love. Okay. So the first person I'm going to introduce you to is Chase McGee. What's up, Chase? Peace, family. Peace. How you doing, Miss Felicia? I'm okay. I, I'm great. I'm so happy you're here. Um, and, you know, so now the next person, this is interesting. So when I was talking to Chase, Chase was, you know, telling me, because um, at the time, I think it was the, the Foundational Black. Uh, um, uh, Foundational Black American yeah. Conference. Yeah. Yes. And I was like, oh, my God. I was like, you know, my favorite, my favorite dude is going to be down there. And that's Professor wow. James Small. And he was like, and all the beautiful things you said about Professor. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. I was like, you got to find him when you're down there. Right. But this brother right here, I tell you, <sighs> Professor James Small, everybody has a professor, Professor James Small story. And that's a beautiful thing I like about him because he's always himself all the time. And he's all he, he represents all of us and he fights for all of us from the beginning of time. So without further ado, Professor James Small. Hey, Professor. Hi, Brother Chase. Hi, Sister Felicia. Well, wow, so, this, this is really nice. It was this good is, talking to Chase last night and to see, almost see yourself, what, almost oh, man. 50 years ago, right? Right. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. You know, um, I was talking to Chase earlier and he was, you know, he was saying that he feels like, you know, he's just kind of getting started. And I'm like, yeah, but I mean, you got one hell of a start, <laughs> you know? Like, definitely. Um, so, you know, before I start, I just want to share this uh, share this little picture that uh, actually uh, Taki sent this to me. And this kind of this is going to set the tone of what we're talking about today. All right. Right there. The youth can walk faster, but the Absolutely. elder knows the road. Absolutely. All right, so uh, Professor, I'm gonna start with you. 
Okay. Why? Because I'm the old guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you. Well, no, you're the one that said that's the rule. Every time we have, we we have, we do we do these talks like when we would have a uh, a showing, a screening. Oh, you know? Yeah, oh, we have a little talk back, and professor is always like you know the older eldest goes first, which is usually for, um, Dr. Jeffries. A shout out to Dr. Jeffries because I know they're looking, um, and to our other elder um, uh, John Henry Staples. Shout out to you guys. Um, but yes, I want to start with you. That's fine. Okay. Uh, I'm happy. I, I mean, I was so impressed talking to Chase last night. I'm willing yeah. to look back and hear his story. You know? Yes. Yeah, Chase got a good story. You know, I told his brother, I was reading his bio, and I was like, damn, this man. And, and the thing about the bio is only like maybe what, seven, seven or eight sentences? And I'm like, yeah. damn, I mean, this brother's done a lot. But you know, um, Professor, when we start talking about this generational gap, like what can you explain to us? What is it? Is it real? Um, and just what are your thoughts on that? Well, I approach that simply. White folks got a generational gap. Black folks cannot afford a generational gap. Right. A generational gap presupposes you don't have a family concept. Mm. See, how are you going to have a family and have a generational gap? That's crazy. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a household where I had my mother, my father, my grandmother, my grandfather, my great grandmother, and a couple of grand aunts. You understand? And I had about 20 other cousins all in that same little 10 room. So you can't have a generational gap there because the whole story of the family mm. is intergenerational transmission of wisdom, concepts, and ideas. Mm -hmm. And if you got a gap, how are you going to do the transmission? Mm. Okay. And so the degree to which we have bought into this white folks concept of the generational gap, we got a problem. Because if you got a gap, you can't teach your babies. Right. You know what I'm saying? How are you gonna tell them, listen, I'm old, my back is bent, my knees are aching, my shoulders are round, my time is short, I'm passing this baton. If there's a gap, you can't pass that baton. The baton on economics, the baton on history, the baton on culture, the baton on how we love and how we define love, you know, the baton on us understanding family as the foundation of civilization itself. And so that's why I was so impressed with our young brother. You know, there, there was a song that says, the children are the future, keep them safe. But that's not true. That's the white man's concept. Mm. The elders are the future. Mm. Just give it a thought. Mm. The elders are the future. And so when you pass the wisdom on, the children are the now. You know, but it's mm -hmm. that body of information that the elders pass forward that allows the children to create as as the elder the future for their children, but the children are the now. They're the what's happening right now. Yeah. Okay. They are the present. Because let me tell you a secret about the future. The instant you step into it, it becomes the past again to instruct the present how to create the possibility that we call the future that never mm. happened, except that it's the present becoming the past. That's some new stuff, right, Felicia? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's some new stuff. That's some new stuff. Let me let me reach for a book. I gotta get out. Yeah, you know, I was sitting here thinking, I was like, how do I, how do I sit down here without a pad and paper? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I always <laughs> got to have a book. And Chase is going to be talking about his books, and I want him to talk about those books tonight yeah. so people can get into it. But there's a book called The Generational, The Generation Trap. The gen, how is that? No, the Intergeneration Trap, The Generation Gap. Now, this is a deep book, and we've overlooked it, right? It's by Baba Obatishaka. And he published this in uh, 2005. And it's called The Integration 
the integration trap, the generation mm -hmm. gap. So you can see it. The integration trap, mm -hmm. the generation gap by Baba Obatishaka. And he deals with this whole concept. This, you just imagine, I want to hand you something, but there's a gap there. It means I can't reach you. Mm. So my whole notion of the future has been cut off. I'm sitting here as the past. So to Chase, I am the future because Chase is the present. Mm. I'm going out of being. He has come into being. You see, white folks remove the present mm. and deal with the past and the future. The future is aspiration, is hope, is desire, is possibility. But the minute you reach it, it doesn't exist because it never comes into existence because it immediately becomes the past again. It is the past mm. and the present. I am the past. Chase, you're the present. Mm. And the past is trying to give you a baton. It says, here's the, the, what I've learned. Right. Take the best of it that you can. Right. And use it to create a world that can aspire and create possibilities, which we call the future. So when you become the past, your children who will be the present, mm. right, mm -hmm. can recycle that information. Yes, indeed. That the way uh, Asa Hilliard used to call it intergenerational transmission of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And that is the key. And that's what the white man did to us. When he cut us off from our history, he cut us off from our memory. Mm -hmm. When he cut us off from our memory, he cut us off from having the ability to do intergenerational transmission of the experiences that produce the wisdom that will allow you to build the now that you, the young people, are living in. Old people don't build the present. Young people do. Mm, yeah. And for me, I always consider myself, my mom said this to my uh, baby girl when my mom was about 85 and her body, she had gotten thin and her body had got crankly and her heart had got bad and her face had gotten wrinkled and her hair had gotten gray. And she said to Nadja, she says, everybody's looking at me like I'm old. She says, but I still feel 16. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm the youth I've always been, but my experience have created a spirit that is the elder because it had to do things and accomplish things and become things and become a part of things. So there's a body of knowledge gained from that that I now pass to you, you know? Mm -hmm. when I, say I, I mean all of the elders, even the elder on the street, homeless and on drugs, have got some wisdom to pass to you. Right. You know? Right. And a yeah. lot of time we walk right past whole institutions because we live in a society that make us look at the wrong things the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. The greatest love in the world is the love between the adult and the child. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so if you go back to Kemet, what are you going to see? You see mama holding the little boy. Right. Holding Haru. Right. Now, and people say, because Haru is the future. No, the Haru is now. A set is the past. Mm -hmm. Now must rest on the past. And the aspirations we call the future is the noun for the children of the now. I hope that makes sense. That's not in the norm. Mm -hmm. But if you understand it, the minute you say, I have reached my future, doesn't exist. It never comes into existence. It immediately becomes the past of the present. Think about it. It becomes right. the yeah. past of the present activities, the present understanding and all of the wisdom and knowledge that was gained by those sets of experiences. Mm -hmm. you know? Because at the end of the day, there is no beginning in an African cosmology. There is no beginning and there is no end. Right. There is no death and there's really no coming into being. We are forever evolving. 
you know, the three of us are talking tonight. We've always been here. Right, right. You know, we will reconfigure the matter configurations, but I know Sister Felicia has given birth to two boys. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Well, what you did was to give birth mm -hmm. to yourself and their fathers. That's all mm -hmm. you had to recreate. So when you create, you've recreated. Who mm -hmm. have you recreated you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're forever evolving. You know, that sun, that's the same sun that Ramesses used to look at. Mm. That's the same mm. sun that uh, Isis and Haru used to look at. Oh. That's the same sun that my mom and daddy used to look at. You know, when we look at it, the Jupiter and Pluto, and we look at the, uh, the Sirius B, and we look at the Big Dipper constellation, 50 million years ago, our ancestors looked at those same things. And what are those things? But all of the things that make all of us up. Right. You understand? Wow. All of the things that make, what, what are we? Your body breaks down to 140 something minerals mm -hmm. and water. And then it is energy that comes from the interaction, that, that friction that creates the energy so that that mineral could keep recreating itself. We are everything. You don't kill human beings when you get hungry to eat them. You eat everything else in nature. Mm. So how come you're a human being and you need to replace all the cells that died yesterday? You don't kill another human being, no. Because you are everything. Mm -hmm. So you can eat anything in nature. Right. You can even eat the pig. Don't let the Muslims fool you. That's the hang up, okay? Right. Because it's certainly, and I don't want to even get into that, but I'm making a point that we are everything. And that's why, you know, I, I'm going to take credit for coining the statement more than three decades ago. We are God having a human experience. I'm not giving that up to anybody. Right. It's when people were afraid to say it. We are God having a human, human experience. What does that mean? When you go into Kemet, all you see them doing is studying cosmology and ecology. Mm -hmm. They've left us so much because of that environment. But if you go anywhere into Africa, you look at the Orishas, they're talking about cosmology and ecology. That nature and we are one. You go into Haiti and look at voodoo. You say, oh, they draw those pretty things on the ground, those symbols they call bebes. Well, what is a bebe? But our ancestors understanding of a cosmic energy configuration that we can comprehend that affects us on earth. And they drew a symbol to describe what that particular cosmic energy configuration is mm -hmm. so that we can learn it as a part of our wisdom school. Culture is your university. Mm -hmm. You guys going up in a building and studying fragments from their culture and what they steal from other culture, but it is your culture with or without a building, that is your university. And your language is the vehicle that carries your culture, mm -hmm. you see, and protects the university. Mm -hmm. with those two together carries out the intergenerational transmission of the body wisdom that have been gained throughout the centuries. So my dear young son, Chase, they have a word, Chase, and um, the Yerba. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lukomi. Most mm -hmm. people think of Lukomi as the name of a religion in Cuba that came from Africa. And that is true, a, a religious form. Mm -hmm. But the word itself means you belong to me and I belong to you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was an important concept when we got on those slave ships to let one another know, despite the beating, the brutality, the rape, the murder, I stood over here in these chains on the other side of the ship, looking at you crying in pain on the other side, and I'm telling you, look on me. Mm. You belong to me, and I belong mm. to you. And that's the way I feel about the youth. Mm -hmm. That's why we can't afford a generation gap. Because right. if there's a gap, you can't pass that baton. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dang. Okay, wow, that's, dang, that's a nice little intro. Yeah. 
Hey, oh my God. Oh, we only get started. Um uh damn. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Dwayne. Wow, that's very generous, um, Dwayne Johnson. You always give give us money. Thank you. We're gonna keep we're gonna keep it moving. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, Mr. Chase. Um mm -hmm. I wanted to just, uh, you know, um, Professor kind of alluded to, you know, your books and this, this and that. But mm -hmm. I just want you to just tell us a, a little bit. Well, you know, tell us whatever you want to tell us about your journey and how mm -hmm. did it lead you to writing three books entitled Voices of the Ancestors? Like, how did you get there? Right, right. And just as a side note, that's why I always tell you, Miss Felicia, I'm a student, because when you listen to Professor James Smalls, it's, it's just <laughs> your head is spinning. You know, you oh, always learn something new. But uh, as far as my journey goes, uh, I'm born and raised in Atlanta. Both of my parents are from Mississippi. So, you know, we keep that Southern culture, you know, out that was instilled in me. So uh, basically growing up in Atlanta, I grew up like many uh, black children in Atlanta. We put our everything in sports. Atlanta is a real big sports city. So as far as sports goes, I played everything as a young age, uh, basically took up football. Uh, went to a very prestigious high school, so I was the Cab High School. Played for the legendary coach Buck Godfrey, who was a man who also wrote many books. Was a man who uh, holds the state record in wins uh, as far as football coaches go in Georgia. Coach Buck Godfrey uh, played for like a legendary little league team out in Delaware, one of the first little league teams to integrate. Uh, but you know, I had that culture around me at a young age, and basically end up going to Jacksonville State uh, to play football. Uh, and there, my freshman year, I tore my ACL, tore my ACL, my meniscus, blew out my knee. And it was a wake up call. It was a wake up call at that point, you know, because it was the first time in my life where I couldn't depend on football. And unfortunately for a lot of young black men like myself, we put out everything in sports because that's all we're shown. When they talk about black history, even when I went to the Black History Museum out there in D.C., it kind of ended with sports. It was like you were a slave and now LeBron James is dunking basketball. So that's how I felt growing up. You know, I was like, listen, the only thing, the best thing I can contribute to my community is sports. So when I got hurt, I was down and I was like, uh, that's it. But of course I went back home, talked to my mom. And the crazy story is I went to the local grocery store and in Atlanta, we have what we call bootleg movies. So we had a bootleg movie, went to the bootleg movie, man, found four movies. And he said, man, I'm going to give you the fifth one free. The fifth one turned out to be Hidden Colors. Mm. And that was the, the best decision ever to get that fifth DVD. He just gave it to me for free. Didn't make me pay for it because I was like, I don't want no it's Hidden Colors. I don't want no Hidden Colors. What's that? You know, so he gave it to me for free. I watched it. And the rest is history. That was in 2014. You know, and from that time on. I just became a student because I realized I didn't know anything, Miss Felicia. And I still tell you that to this day. I don't really know anything. I feel like a kid in the candy store with all this candy going around, all this different, uh, you know, customs, traditions, all these different people to learn about. So for the next, I would say, five years from 2014 to 2019, I was just studying. And whatever I studied, I would write down. So I was making sure that not only did I study it, but I actually wrote it down and tried to rememorize it, tried to learn it. So I would do that for on and off 2014 all the way to 2019 until I put out my first book, uh, Voice of the Ancestors, Volume 1. And every year since then, we've been putting out a book since, you know, so 2019, 2020 and 2021. And that's that's how the story goes. So it's a crazy thing how an uh, injury can turn into a blessing, you know, something that I thought that was man, I'm a nobody now turned into a blessing. And I got that blessing from a bootleg man at the store. So like Professor Smalls was saying that we can learn something from the elder that's on drugs on the corner. I learned something the bootleg man changed my life when he gave me hidden colors. You know, that was yeah. the rest is history after that. That changed my whole how I look at everything and, uh, you know, just how I receive things. Mm -hmm. You know, but you kind of appear to be um, a young person that has has always like respected your elders you think it's because right. you're from the south because you, you uh, see yeah. you that and i know yeah, professor yeah. from the south too and he talks about that right right uh you know just i was always i was one of the fortunate ones i was brought up in a two-parent household so you know i had a mother and a father figure strong father strong mother and uh 
raised me, you know, raised me better than I could ever imagine, you know. So just coming from that Mississippi, that Southern hospitality, just knowing to respect your elders, even certain things now, like I still don't, I might curse on my little things, but I don't curse in front of my mom. It feels weird to me. I, I don't curse. It's just one of the things. I don't curse in front of my grandma. If I pull up in my car, going over their house to visit, I turn down the music. I turn down the cursing music because it's just one of them things just out of respect. It's just instilled in me. You know, at a young age, we already knew, even if you and your cousins y'all out there in front of y'all listening to so-called gangster rap, we're going to turn it off when grandma pull in the driveway. You know, we're going to, you know, it's just the certain things like that that was always instilled in me. So it was easy to, you know, receive information from the elders that came before me at a young age. You know, that's just how I was raised. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, you know, that's that's one of the things, you know, let, let me add a little something, Brother Chase, mm -hmm. with your family being from Mississippi. Right. Mine being from South Carolina, but most of the folks in Mississippi was taken from South Carolina doing the cotton. Yes, indeed. Cotton. Yes, indeed. But what's so beautiful about Mississippi, because when our people went there and they were on that Delta, they recreated the Niger. They recreated mm -hmm. the river. They recreated right. the Delta River on that delta and right. so in Mississippi and New Orleans, but especially Mississippi, you got a, an African recreation because right. that's the only thing they could create. Right, right. They recreated Africa. So it's not a Southern culture you're coming out. Mm. You're coming out of the South, Southern right. United States, African culture. Right, right, right. They recreated down in Mississippi. Right, right. It's a, uh, it's a beautiful it's thing. It's hard at us in Mississippi because Mississippi is black on black and black. Mm, right, right, right. Okay. Right, right. A lot, okay. a lot of history in Mississippi. Uh, you know, me and my father talk about it all the time, just out of that green. They're from Greenwood. So uh -huh. my father's my father's side of the family is from Starville, Mississippi, and that's kind of where the Mississippi State University is. So mm -hmm. they own a lot of that Black Jack Road that's around Mississippi State University. Uh, and my mother's side is from Greenwood, Mississippi which is, I mean, the Mississippi Delta, just in general, a lot of musicians, B.B. King, and a lot of those people come out of that Delta, Denise LaSalle, and, and a lot of musicians, even Tulsa, Oklahoma, like Wall Street, they call it the Greenwood District because a lot of those people came from Greenwood, Mississippi. So it was, it's just a very uh, rich and tradition culture down there in Mississippi, and I'm proud to be a part of it, you know? Yeah, well, that's what's up. That's You're what's African up. alive, son, African alive. Oh, no. Absolutely. Um, all right. So, uh, Professor, can you just give us some historical context in terms of the relationship between elders and young people? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. If we just go back to the continent, mm -hmm. every African ethnic group or what the West called tribal group have secret societies for the male youth and secret society for the female youth. And in those social orders, and that's what we were trying to replicate with the Soras and the fraternities. We just kind of lost our way because we got Greek instead of African. <laughs> but even as Greeks, we had more African going on when we pay attention in the Soras and the fraternity than we want to admit to. But due to research, those things are right out of Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay, just wanted to drop that. So people won't see that the gap ain't as big as you think. Mm -hmm. you know? But if you go back to the continent, we had these rites of passage societies for our children. And they went into them at a very young age. And they didn't emerge until after puberty, when they were at the age where they were ready to take on responsibilities in the community or ready to take on a husband or take on a wife. In that training process, elders from different sectors of the community would do classes for them, would do training for them. And this is something that happened over years. This happened throughout their life, okay? Whatever field they had to work in or fishing they had to do or hunting they had to do, they had to break away when they were finished with those things, they had to go under this tutelage. Mm -hmm. So there was no disconnect between the next generation and the elder generation. Mm -hmm. And so one of the most famous ones we know is the Poro Society in Liberia, because like most of these societies 
uh, that we call secret societies, they still exist all over Africa. Mm. If you read Jomo Kenyatta book, Facing Mankenya, there's a whole chapter in there devoting, devoted to the young people and how you prevent molestation and rape mm -hmm. of a young man gonna feel his oats at 10 or 11, okay? That, 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 that sperm gonna be rising up and you know what it's gonna be looking for. So they had a concept in their rights of passage program. And there's this house in each village where the boys and the girls, and they would tie the girls in a way, you put a cloth on in a way so a man could not get to her sacred space, but they could, what we call petting each other so that they could release that energy in a positive way without the, any intercourse, without any pregnancy, without any rape or molestation. And anyone that tried to get past the, and this was all supervised. You got to read the book, Facing Mount Kenya by Joe Kenyatta, who headed the Mau Mau, right? And, and, and anyone that violated that got kicked out of the group. See, everybody who was 13 in that year was bound together in a group for the rest of their life as mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. And if you got kicked out of your age group, you had nowhere to go. You were no man in no man's land by yourself and nobody wanted to be there. Yeah. These are just some of the things. Um, and then in Ghana, every town you go to, every village, they have something called the Asapo companies for the men. They were like the Asapos were the youth militia that protected the village. But it was the process in which the youth were raised to the level of adulthood with all the principles, concepts, ideas, and responsibility that would make them men of respect and honor. Mm -hmm. And it was similar societies for the women. And they became like the militia that guarded and protect their people as they move into manhood. And so in America, we did it with the black church. Before, when slavery ended, 90% of black people were not in anybody's church. There's a big myth on how we converted to slavery doing, I mean, to mm -hmm. Christianity doing slavery. Yes, some of that occurred, but the bulk of it occurs after slavery. Why? Because Christianity, the church as a model, was the only institution we were allowed to express our spiritual essence. We couldn't build no shrine, they would lynch our butts, murder us, mm -hmm. burn it down. We couldn't build no mosque, even though the mosque is alien to us too in certain ways. But we could build a church. You know what we took in the church? The only thing we had, our African essence. Mm -hmm. And so the black church always had a rites of passage program, especially mm -hmm. the Baptist church, especially the Southern church around Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, South Carolina. Yeah. And I remember the one I went through. The graduating process was called the morning bench. Mm. Now, when all of us got 13 in that little village I grew up in South Carolina, we were all gathered up, only those who were 13 that year, either 12 or 13. I forgot which one it is. Now I'm getting old. <laughs> Look, I taste when we throwing you that stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so we were all called in, right, mm -hmm. at age. And then we were tutored for a year. You had to pick a church. The men had to pick a church father and the ladies had to pick a church mother. This right. is one of the deaconess or the deacons or one of the elder men and women in church who were in a position of honor. And that person becomes your surrogate father. Just like in Africa, that would be your mother's brother who would be the uncle. He has more authority of raising the son than the father. And so, we didn't know this then. I would learn when I get to Africa, I go like, oh my God, this is what we were doing in the black church before the black church went astray. Some mm -hmm. of us. And so at the end of that year of tutoring, we went to something called the moaning bench. And I would not see that concept again until I get initiated into the Yoruba religion. Mm -hmm. And I went through the same process. We were, they were brought in an evangelist from out of town. They would not use your local preachers. They brought someone that could shake it down, rock and roll it, just, you know, you know, an evangelist, her job or his job, I had, we had a woman. She can rock the African spirit. People mm -hmm. be jumping over bench, getting the Holy Spirit. I mean, like, 
People don't do that no more in church, but we were in Africa back then, right? Right, right. And so you had seven days of music, drumming, dancing, clapping, and rhythm with your eyes closed on your knees on this bench with all of your age group peers. It's called the Monin Bench. A few churches still do it in the South, right? And you had your family's job was to bring the spiritual rhythm. Mm. But each family sung a song over their child in turn. I still remember my song was Save Me, Save Me, Lord, Save My Soul from the Burning Hell. Mama and them rocked that church. On the third day, I got possessed. <laughs> you know what I'm about? I got possessed, I was shouting and dancing, and right. they, they test you to make sure you ain't faking. You know, they want to make sure you really got the Holy Ghost. And then once you get it, then you can sit down with the congregation. And in turn, each child, the family would rock their music and rock their rhythm and rock their dance and rock their clap and sing. And that preacher would throw down and you would get hit. Bam! Mm. You started crying and singing and talking in tongues. And, go. and at the end of the day, if anybody didn't come up, they had to wait and join another group next year with permission. But in that case, all of our all of our group came up, and we were bound together for the rest of our life. Wow! And the church father that you took, you got to take care of him like your father for the rest of his life. Mm. And the woman, the same thing with their church mothers. That's all out of Africa, and mm -hmm. it's in all the churches in the South. We just forgot what we hid. Mm -hmm. But this is how that intergenerational transmission was going on right in the black church right in front of the white man. He thought we were just singing and shouting, having a good old time. He didn't realize we were practicing intergenerational transmission of power, mm -hmm. of wisdom, mm -hmm. of guidance, of understanding right. you know, to our children. Right. And to the degree we've lost this for in exchange for some modern type of Western Christianity, yeah. is the degree to which we see the fractures in that generational relationship in the black church. Right. Mm. And I'm using the black church because 90 something percent of our people are in the church. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So, um, so Professor, um, what do you think that elders- Wait a minute. John Henley said he went on the morning bench too. All right, brother John. <laughs> <laughs> right there. Tell you. Yeah, you know what yes. I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, John Henry Staples. You know, I mean, you 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 know everybody. You, you guys all know each other. But John, if for for you guys that are um, just looking at this, John Henry Staples is one of our elders that mm. um, has been supporting Hoppy since like day one. Mm. Uh, we talk on the phone with him. He is always representing. He used to run the streets with um with uh you know like professor um uh, small um dr jeffries you know and that's the thing like all you guys were running streets everywhere but collectively but different which is so that's like straight fire um but yeah so we, we uh yeah we love dr um i mean john henry staples so um so the professor thing i want you to know is this still goes on Mm -hmm. City College, Dr. Jeffries and I, and Sister Jeannie Bain and Jerry Price, we created something called the Sons of Africa and the Daughters of Africa. And 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 this was to keep that gap from getting there, you know? Yeah. So these young people were moving with Dr. Francis Welsing, Dr. John Henry Clark, Chancellor Williams, Dr. Ben, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, Dr. Malana Karanga, um, Barbara Sizemore, they right. they were learning from those people, Sister Kepha Neftis, the First World Alliance, the Slave Theater. And, and so the Soras and the fraternities in the college, that was its original purpose. Mm. The preparation of the leadership for the next generation by pulling the best of us together. Mm -hmm. You see, pulling the best of us together. But we, when that integration thing hit, we lost our way. That's why I love the title of my brother's book. It says, The Integration Trap, The Generation Gap. Mm. Yeah. And it's yeah. worth studying. And then I'm going to come back. I'm going to shut my mouth 
Chase, because I talk too much sometimes, you know. No, never that. Never that. You know that was, you know, the short end of the stick, right? So we trying to get as much stuff out as possible, you know. But I'm gonna cool out. Yeah. No, um, we're gonna before you cool out, you got one more. I got one more question. Right, right. And before we turn the um baton to um to Mr. McGee over there, what um what do you think elders, if anything, can learn from young people? I think the main thing we can learn from young people is how to submit to new ways of doing things. Mm. 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 Yes. How, you know, we have, yeah. I had a way of learning, but I've tried to always hang with the young folks. I want to like, how do I work this apple? You know what I'm saying? No. How do I work the iPhone, okay? Yes. Zoom, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on, you yeah. know, I, I'm, I'm on Lincoln, LinkedIn, the whole, I need to be there. So you have to take me there and I need to hear you. I need to like, what is it that you see in the society now that I can no longer see because I'm full. Mm. You know, I got 75 years in me, I'm full so I can't see certain things. So the young people become our eyes, you know, right. become our ears, and we have to let them tell us what they're seeing around. What terrain are we in now? How how do we work in this thing we're in now? How do we understand the ecology we are in now? And that's what the youth have to help us elders to understand. And the elders have to learn to submit. When you submit to the youth, I'll tell you a little secret. This is the biggest secret kept in the world. The youth is the ancestors, people. Who? Mm. Mm. The youth mm. is your ancestors. All of us from South know that term. He, she done come back again. He done come back again. Right. We understood it. This is my ancestor sitting there. Right. You understand. And so, I should submit. We always say we pour in libation to the ancestors, but we don't know the concept. Right. Okay, the youth is the ancestor come back, mm. and when and they've come back with new guidance, they've come back with a new message, they've come back with new directions, they've come back with new instructions on how to behave in the environment we currently find ourselves in, and the condition us elders physiologically, psychologically, and spiritually currently find ourselves in, and so. Be willing to, somebody just put it, to be willing to study and learn from the youth. The youth yeah. and the ancestors, they've come to teach us. Right. We have passed them the bowl of knowledge we had. Mm -hmm. They're now going to innovate on it and improvise on it and give us a new way to look at the world with that same knowledge that we were looking at the world with 40 years ago. But they're going to give us a new way to look at it now. So it's more effective in solving the problems we're facing. Because you are our ancestors come back. Absolutely. Wow. Oh, shame. Mm. But that goes right towards your book, brother. So you better get on Absolutely. it. Yeah. Absolutely. You know what? Yeah, I'm about to ask Chase the same question. Um, so Chase, what do you think young people can learn from, from the elders? Uh I think to to be plain and simple, it's just like the proverb that you put up at first. You know, the young can walk fast, but the elder know the way. You know, the elders, oftentimes we don't understand that history repeats itself. History is the greatest teacher. And many times some of the thoughts that we have as youngin', the elders didn't already had that thought when they were young. You know, some of the movements, some of the like I hear brothers all the time, man, we need to pick up and we need to do this. We need to do that. The elders have already done that in the past. And we need to study the elders movement and listen to them because they know where they went wrong. You know, I think we got to get big on energy as youngins. The thing that separates us is energy. We bring the energy to the movement, but we waste a lot of energy doing the same thing and falling for the same traps and the same mistakes mm. that many of our elders fell for. And when they try to tell us, we kind of don't want to hear it because at the same time, we got the white man in our ear who is telling us, listen to this elder, but don't listen to this elder. Mm. You know, they do this all the time. Listen to MLK, but don't listen to Malcolm. You know, uh, listen to uh, people like John Lewis, but don't listen to Kwame Ture, even though they were in the same organization doing the same thing at the same time. So mm -hmm. I think that's a 
that's a big part of it. Just understanding that the elder has already done what you've already, what you're aspiring to do or what you're trying to do. And if we're going to be big on energy, if we're going to be big on uh, concentrating our efforts, then we have to be able to listen to the elders and, and just move forward strategically. So, yeah, yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's clear. Um, That's clear understanding. Clear yeah. understanding. Yes, 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 yes. Um, okay. Wow. You know, this is so, I just love looking at both of you guys. This is just, this is really, this is nice because this is our future. It's right here. You know, there's so much work for us to, to, to be doing. And I think it's um, so nice, you know, that um, you two are here and you're yourself, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, who you are, you know, in, in all of this, but, and how, but how we're all still connected. Mm -hmm. And how everyone, you know, that's watching this needs to get connected because everybody knows someone that's young and everybody knows someone that's, you know, that's elderly, but we got to get connected. And this is why this, this, like this right here. Right. right. Um, and can I add please. something to that, Mr. Uh -huh. Lee? Absolutely. Because me and Professor Smalls were having a conversation last night about, uh, you know, how a lot of those organizations and a lot of the young movements that were happening in the 60s were co-opted by other organizations and other groups of people who now benefit off those same civil rights that we fought and died for. And that goes to now the Asians, the Arabs, the Indians. And so I think we're seeing the same thing now. And that's why it's so important we listen to the elders like Professor Smalls and, and just study history because those same movements that we were going out there for, the George Floyd protest and the things of that nature where everybody was talking about, we want tangible, we want resources. Those resources are now going to members of the Asian community, uh, the East Indian community, the Arab community. They're going to everybody but us. So they co-opt our movements in a lot of ways. So we have to understand that. And uh, like I say, listen to the elders, uh, because oftentimes it happened to them first. You know, and history always repeats itself. And, and that's the clarity, uh, Chase, that so many of our people don't understand. And, and it's such a sensitivity with us because we suffered uh because we were not europeans in america we tend not to want to criticize uh non-europeans who are helping to oppress us mm. whether they're aware right. of it or not right and if we don't we keep perpetuating our own demise mm -hmm. we have to tell people you are standing on my foot now you don't get yeah. off from bad gonna happen right right so you can't be smiling and be and be saying Oh, salam alaikum, kefahalik, and you selling me rotten meat. Right. You can't tell me, oh, I'm a Muslim meme, and you selling beer and wine in the back of the store. Absolutely. I mean, let, let's get it right now. Right, right. You, know, you can, Malcolm said, at the end of the day, those who exploit us take the money. When the sun goes down, they take the money to another part of town. If you're going to have your business in my community, then live in my community, invest in my community, grow with me in my community, or I'm going to understand you are not in my community, and I have to take the necessary steps to remove you from my community. That's right. That's right. That's right. I won't be preaching, but like yeah. I, I say, um, <laughs> We have to figure out how we go. How do we do this? And, and, and Dr. John Henry Clark said it best. Black people don't have any friends. You know, that's one thing I'm cool with. Mm -hmm. people, you know, we get so afraid of, you know, and I'm sure Professor Jolly Small can protest to this. We get so afraid of people not liking us. You know, what, what's going to happen if the Asian community are not our friend? What's going to happen? What, what are they going to do? <laughs> what, what are they going to do that we so <laughs> afraid of? You know, we our, our, our women not going to have the weaves anymore. What's going to happen? That's just they're just so vital to our community. You know, we yeah. support all these communities, even since day one. Like I said, a lot of those civil rights acts in the 60s were tied to a lot of those immigration laws that helped them come over. Uh, a lot of their communities, these Chinese shops, these hair stores, nail shops are set up in our community. We make up their main base, you know, yeah. and these communities, like I say, they could give a damn about us, honestly. So, you know. Right. It, it and, and we've got to be clear. See, part of. Mm -hmm. What the generational relationship is, and Chase was talking about earlier, is like how I get my information to Chase about the road I was walking down, which is the same road he's not walking, he's now walking down without right. Chase stepping in the potholes I stepped in. Mm, I right, right. The cliff I fell off of. Right. You know what I'm saying? 
That's why it's essential right. that us elders communicate back to the youth mm -hmm. and that the youth be susceptible to having this communication. Because that's why I love the term Luke or me. You are me and I am you. Absolutely. You belong Absolutely. To me and I belong to you. Absolutely. You are my ancestor. Come back. Mm -hmm. The future is the present right mm -hmm. now. Right. And you are that present. Right, right. You know? mm. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, okay. All right. Um, Professor Small, you were talking about something yesterday, and I said, No, stop. I don't even want to hear the story. You got <laughs> to me like you know seriously like i was talking to chase earlier i was like nah. i was like let me just ask you just some little basic little questions because i want to hear all of this for the first time right here so you were telling me about your relationship with hip-hop okay can you please just talk to me about your relationship with hip-hop because that's also you know you guys were elders reaching back to um to the youngins so talk to us about that well, you got to figure now, when hip hop started, I didn't have any gray hair yet. Yeah. <laughs> in my 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. um, but we had a very good relationship. Um, there was a sister named Dr. Barbara Justice, who was very active in the hip hop community. She was a brain surgeon, the only black female, if not the only black surgeon in New York. They went after her and took her license, but she went back to medical school and became a psychiatrist and went out to California to practice. But she, <laughs> Our house was right across the street from City College. On any given day, Sister Soldier with eight or nine or 10 other rappers, male and females were there. Me and Dr. Jeffries and other elements of Black Studies Department, we were with them talking about what should be said, talking about the history and culture. We sit on KRS one bed, Dr. Jeffries and myself, um, with Dr. J talking to them about history, about culture, and Chris and them learning. I mean, Public Enemy was as close to us as we are to you. Mm. Mm. Professor Griffith was my, like my son. When he had his issues, he came to my house. Right. You know? Right. Uh, Tupac's mom and dad was my friends. I spoke to Tupac the day before he died. Mm. He needed to talk to me about some action him and Biggie and them was taken. And he told me, he said, Professor Small, me and Biggie, we're not at war. I said, that's the press. They're doing mm. this. This was Tupac's last words to me. He said, we're trying to see how we can take over distribution. Mm. Mm. And then I told him, I said, Pac, you know, you, you're going up against the mafia with that one. You <laughs> yeah. alone can't do that. He said, no, we organize and other brothers across the country. Of course, two days later, he was gone. Mm -hmm. so, mm. um, hip hop, and I spoke on it very early. Look at the time, what we call hip hop was already happening but decades before in terms of that music genre. I remember a guy down in South Carolina, a little roadside, dusty floor, wood floor club, when you dance, the dust came up through the cracks, called Club 17. And the other one was called Daddy O's. Boy, let me, I don't even tell you what going on in those clubs. But there's a brother named Jerome Ford, and he had two turntables, but he would play only one record at a time. And he had a brother, they didn't have the beat machines then, so he had a brother on bass drum, bass and snares, who would play the bass and snare behind or over the record, just like they did with the beats later with the machine. And this brother was called Onion. And let me tell you, they could kick it. And they would come all the way up the coast. They would come and play in Philadelphia. They would play in, in, in DC. They would play in New York. And when people saying this was imported from the Caribbean, no, that is not historically true and accurate. It didn't start in the projects in the Bronx. It took on a new life there. Ooh. What happens after the 60s with the destruction of Malcolm X, with the shattering of the nation of Islam, with the, the botchery and the killing and the beat down of the Black Panther Party, with the sentencing of the brothers from the and sisters from the Black Liberation Army, with the killing of Dr. King, white folks went into a shift. And let me show you a couple of things that happened in the country, more than a couple. They took music out of the schools. Now, some who's old enough to know, we know when they just took the music curricula out of black schools across the country. You know, because all of our schools had a band, had a yeah. music department. I played in a band, yep. <laughs> and almost every black community, you had a drum and bugle corps. All of a sudden, all those thousands of bugles just disappeared. 
all those drums just disappeared. And there's no more parades. We used to have parades almost every day for some reason. But those things just disappeared. Somebody moved against us. They understood mm -hmm. that music was the thing that we brought from Africa that we used to constantly inform, instruct, and direct our spirits. In the 1970s, when what we know is what I call modern hip hop takes off and the Bronx being the genesis of that phenomenon that's known, it was happening in Brooklyn and other places too, but the Bronx get the credit for us, so I'll give them that. But this was happening. Oh, yeah, but you know what, listen, you know, people argue now. What happened, you remember Hall and Oates? You had now black singers, and even Motown went into the bag. The bag, Motown. Mm -hmm. So when Barry Gordy moved to California, they sold Motown to the white folks. Motown mm -hmm. started taking even the Temptations into crossover music, wanting to be on the white charts. Mm -hmm. And then you had all these white singers now on the black charts, singing like black people. And then knocked us out of the arena where we were given the spiritual message that we were getting from the impressions, the temptations, uh, Martha and the Vandellas, and and oh my God. Yeah. Every time psh, that music takes you down on a journey, you know. Yes. And so <laughs> yeah. That, that, when that when they took it out, took the music out of the schools, when they they brought the white music into our radio stations in this concept of crossover, had the black musicians singing for white audience, the black youth had just been crushed in the move against the Black Panther, the killing of Dr. King, the killing of Malcolm, all this happened in the 60s. We're in the 70s, and I said, God gave us a voice. The God mm -hmm. of the ancestors gave us a new voice and says, listen, you don't need a drum. You don't need a horn. You don't need a piano. Take your voice. Your voice alone will create a new music that will conquer the world. Mm. If we really want to understand hip hop, understand that the ancestors and the divine say, oh, they're going to take all the mediums away from us. So we can't communicate at all. I'm going to bring alive in you a medium that I gave you when I brought you here. Your very palate, your tongue, your mm. teeth, your voice. And you will create a, mu um, a, a music gender that will conquer the world like not in the history of the world. And you can still carry your message. You can still do your social commentary. You can still tell your story of what's happening in the ghetto and right. tell your story of what's happening in the middle class marketplace. Right. And no one will be able to stop you. If you remember in the beginning, but none of y'all are old enough, they laughed at it. That this ain't going nowhere. And it conquered the world. Mm -hmm. It's the vocal cord yeah. in the dance of the young black men and women telling their stories that the newspaper was no longer telling and the radios were no longer telling and the TV was no longer telling. That concept of the revolution will not be broadcast. White folks said, we ain't going to give them that opportunity no more. Right. God and the ancestors gave us hip hop. Right. One of the most revolutionary music gender in the history of our music forms in America. <laughs> we're gonna just take a uh, a little short little commercial break just to let right. just let we gotta take a just a deep breath with you uh, professor you know you guys are definitely dropping some um some jewels right here so listen guys if um if you haven't seen hoppy um please right there is hoppyfilm.com please check us out um and you know get your digital copy get your dvd um right here we have a whole new we have a whole new look on our DVD now. Look at that gold popping right there. <laughs> so get your DVD copy. You know, like I was saying last week, I was, you know, The Wiz is probably like my favorite movie of all time. And I have it in every version you can think of. Um, and so please, you know, please, please support. This brother right here, um, Chase. Let me, let me add something, sister. Add something. It's my voice. If my voice means anything, the only people that they love, Brother Small. Please give financial support to Happy. The white folks is not going to support Happy. Okay? Right. Other groups are not going to support the concept of Happy. Only we can do that. Your one dollar, your five dollar, your twenty dollar, your fifty dollar, your hundred dollar. You want to drop a couple of grand up there too? That's nice too. 
But unless we support happy, this kind of discussion with our beautiful little son here, 25 years old, have written three books. He sounds like he's 65. <laughs> when, I, when I was talking to him last night, I go like, this little boy sounds like an old man, an old spirit. Yes. But, you know, help constantly promote happy talk and happy's effort by making whatever donation you can. No amount is too small and no amount is too big. But it's a way we show love for ourselves by taking care of ourselves. And, and of course, um, you know, show all the other kinds of support for the different things in the happy store. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And one of the things we're going to do is I didn't even tell you this, Chase. So listen, because, you know, we like we, we like supporting um, definitely like supporting our young brothers. So right. happy the, our happy movement. Mm -hmm. There's uh, four principles. And the last one is uh, teach the youth the truth, even though the, the youth is teaching us the truth. That's what's up. The first five people that can um, email us um, three things that you learned about Chase tonight. Right. com. you're going to get a copy of his new book. First five people. Yes. Um, and so let me put the um, address because I know you guys want to ask me right there. First five people, three, you got to do three things. Okay? Right, right. Things that you learned about Chase um, over here. And we're going to um, get you the copy because, you know, I just said, I was like, oh, wait, I need to, I already ordered my copy. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm missing cop, uh, voices number two. I was like, I gotta get voices number two. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So you guys, please, you know, and this is what we're talking about when we, when we are, um, when you guys are donating, we're putting it right back into, you know, the very people that are doing the work. And yeah. Chase is definitely, um, you know, doing the work. Thank you, um, Chase. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Miss Felicia. Um, I just that is so cute. You call me Miss Felicia. Oh, <laughs> I'm just like, oh my god, I'm a miss now. I'm a miss. Respect, I'm in respect. Exactly. Always, it, always, always. Even from the first time I talk to you, it, it, like even when I'm talking to you on the phone or when you're texting me, it's always Miss Felicia. That's what's up, mm -hmm. yo. I I love you guys. Okay, all right. We gonna keep going. Um, all right. Um, so. You know what, Professor, we're going to start back with you because you had mentioned some of these groups like First World Alliance, the Slave Theater, Shrine of Black Madonna. Like, what do you what do you um, attribute the fall of those organizations to? Well, many of them, you know, were attacked by Quintel Pro and the FBI and the local mm -hmm. intelligence apparatus because they knew that was where a lot of the intergenerational exchange was taking place. Mm -hmm. The youth was always at least half, if not more, of the audience of the Slave Theater or the First World Alliance or working with African Heritage Studies Association, the AHSA, or the National Black Studies Association or the ASCAC Association, the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization. And there were many others. And one of the attacks was on our cultural institutions and our educational institutions. And we didn't pay attention because we didn't know what was happening. You know, the buildings we were in, all of a sudden now they sold it to somebody. Mm. So we got no place to meet no more. Um, they put a gulf between, we were doing a lot out of the churches and then a gulf came between there when the churches got involved in this partnership with the government. Right. The government was giving you money to build senior homes and the government is giving you money to buy bands, but the government is telling you, you can't have them radical professors and radical community youth in your church anymore. And right. so a lot of the churches started closing their doors to us in the urban centers. Um, but it, it went even more than that. You know, new genders came about, you know, where you had the computer now be more accessible in the home, mm -hmm. you know, you had the Facebooks right, coming into being. You had other forms and mediums. And then they declared war on us in that period in one of the most vicious ways in the history of this country. I would dare say that, slave, that um, the crack epidemic and the crack war is second only to slavery mm. and the destruction that it wrought on the black community. Mm. And we know for a fact that came straight out of Washington, D.C. 
That was the CIA, you understand? Mm -hmm. This was an international conspiracy to destroy the black youth. Mm -hmm. See, because when Dr. Martin Luther King marched down the street, we're accustomed to seeing all the elders holding hands and hands on the first two rows, right? But 90% of the people following Dr. King was the youth. These were teenagers. Right. Okay. The Black Panther Party was mostly teenagers. This was the black youth. Haruak was the black youth. The Nation of Islam medium age was between 16 and 25. This was the black youth. Yeah. And so, and let's just go deeper. The Blackstone Rangers in Chicago, you know, we can call them gangsters and drug dealers, but these were the black youth rising up against oppression in the only way they could. Right. The Crips and the Bloods before the police infiltrated and took them over. That's why Tuki was taken off the scene. You know, the head of the Blackstone Rangers in Chicago was taken off the scene and given life. And so many others of our youth leaders in the urban center. And then the white media called them uh, drug dealers and gangsters and so forth. But they didn't tell you how they were trying to protect those communities. Organized. We didn't have all this killing in our communities back then. Mm -hmm. But they came in and declared war on us with crack. Right. You understand? And at the same time, they declared war with the chemical. Then they declared war with the law with three strikes and you're out. Mm. And within a couple of years, millions of our youth was in the penitentiary. And once you're in that system, you're being abused in all kinds of other ways. Mm -hmm. And then when you come out of the prison, hundreds of thousands of people a year, all your civil rights have been taken away. So how are you going to survive? So you cycle right back into the system. That was war. Still is war. And it's run by the government of the United States, which is ethnic European partners and even some of us partnership mm -hmm. in that genocide. And so we can't just see it in the back and it's not separate from the black movement. All those things crush that movement that we saw in the 60s because the target was the black youth. The right. only thing that saved the black youth, it was two things, I wouldn't say the only. It was us kicking down the doors of colleges and getting hundreds of thousands of more going and getting credentials and training. But the thing that was the greatest salvation to the black youth was hip hop and mm -hmm. rap music. Okay, mm -hmm. people don't want to talk about it, but history is going to have to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. The greatest salvation was hip hop and rap music. It gave them a way to be when the rest of the society said you don't even exist. Yeah. Mm. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. God, I, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they made money and right. brought yeah. and took care of their parents. Right. And did things in the community. Yeah. People don't have to like Jay Z or have to like Beyonce. Mm -hmm. But look at how many people's bail they paid doing the, the, the demonstration. Look at how many other people they help out of jail. Look at the monies they sent to happen to the continent of Africa to help poor people in their medical situations and the school situations. And they're not the only ones doing it. All right. Across the spectrum, you know, people were saying the other day, well, Stevie Wonder is moving to Africa. Well, hell, I made Stevie in Ghana in the 1980s. <laughs> wow. And he already had a studio there and mm -hmm. a home. So it's not something new. He may say, I'm tired with this now, I'm gonna make it permanent, mm -hmm. you know? But many of the, the when you go to Ghana, their music genre is called hip life. The, the jazz music in Ghana is called high life. Mm -hmm. So hip hop came out and when they adopted hip hop, they call they merged it with their jazz music and call it hip life. And it took mm -hmm. Africa by storm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So hip hop and rap was, was a salvation for that generation that was attacked chemically with, with crack and legally with, with, with the three strikes and your outlaws that they came uh, and to remove us from the streets. And this is after slaughtering the Panther Party. We've seen the movie, Judith, you know, Judith, what is it called? The one about Brother Fred. Judas and the Black Messiah. Yeah, Judas and the Black Messiah. That's an example of what they were doing. That's real. I was there. I knew Brother Fred. I was with him and Mark here in New York, I think about three or four weeks before that incident happened. They were here in the city. 
Right. And so the, that's an example of the government of the United States moving on black youth. Fred was what, younger than you, Chase? So, yeah, he was 21. You know, he's younger than you. Yeah, 21. Yeah, but he was a young God. Yeah, yeah, yes, and sir. They, they were scared of him. And, and he was just one of hundreds of thousands of young God, male and females. Right. And so that's why they declared you war on the black youth right. and then used the media to make the black community scared of the black youth. Right. By vilifying the black youth to the very community that they were a part of while they were victimizing that black youth. The black youth led the Black Panther Party. The black right. youth led the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee. The black youth was the front line in core. The black youth was the front line in Dr. King's movement. And they knew that. Mm -hmm. so let's go at the youth. Absolutely. And then we use the media to vilify the youth by making the black community thinking your own youth is preying upon you. So leave them to us. We'll handle them. So we'll come up with some laws that we'll put them all in jail. We'll put a million in jail in two years. Mm -hmm. Recycle mm -hmm. them to death and destruction. Right. But hip hop broke the back of all of that. Mm -hmm. That rap music that we, yeah, they came in and tried to destroy it because mm -hmm. gangster rap, yes, it was going on, but it wasn't given the upper level until white folks decide, let's get rid of the conscious rappers. The very Congress itself and the president went after Sister Soja. Mm -hmm. The Congress and the president went after KRS-One. Right. And those, Tommy Matola and all the other little criminals running around there and Interscope and the others, you know, mm -hmm. Tried to destroy so many other of the conscious rappers by not even giving them a play. You know, let the truth be the light. Only the truth can set you free. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, what do you think about um, Chase? What do you think about like where music is now with with young people? Um, like what's this, what's your whole take on that? Uh, as far as music, I look at it as a form of expressing the communities they're in now. You know, I understand when young brothers say uh, talk about the poverty or they talk about having to get it the street way. I understand that because they just displaying their part of their reality. You know, what I try to do is give them some other things or give them some knowledge, wisdom that they can talk about. That's not per se looking at the street angle. You know, so uh, when you introduce certain brothers, for example, I had a brother the other day tell me, man, all I know is slavery. That's all I know as far as my history goes. All I know is slavery. He don't know about anything before slavery. He don't know about any resistant movements. He doesn't know about any history in Africa and that we had all over the world. You know, so that's all they rap about. All they rap about is the communities they in right now, uh, how they're living, how they got to get money, because that's their life. That's all they know. So I see it that way. I see it that way. But I feel like they have a very powerful voice because like Professor Small says, whenever the rappers so-called get in trouble, it's because they become political. When they become political, all of a sudden, you know, when you had uh, brothers like Ice Cube in the 90s who started to get political, uh, when you have uh, brothers like even that's not a rapper, but it's an entertainer, Nick Cannon, when he did the show with Professor Griff, they had no Nick Cannon has been a darling child his whole career, his whole <laughs> career. They love Nick Cannon. He's the host on The mass Singer. He's been in Hollywood since he's been like 10 years old. All of a sudden he does the show with Professor Griff. They start speaking truth to power. Now, all of a sudden he's on an apology tour. He's got to apologize. He said he was going to pick up the documentary that with Dr. Sabi. Now, all of a sudden, they, they started to shun him. Now he's anti-Semitic. They start throwing out words that really make no sense when you know the etymology of the words. But, uh, you know, that's what they do. That's what they do. So I just look at hip hop as a form of expressing itself. And uh, it can be very powerful when we become and get on code and get political with it. Right. And let's put it in let's put it in verbal context. Hip hop is a revolutionary response right. to the oppression, particularly of the inner city black youth in the United mm -hmm. States of America. Right. All of our music have always, from rag to blues, to jazz, to bebop, to rhythm and blues, all of our music was about social commentary and protest. Even mm -hmm. our church music, Right. In the day when we call it spiritual and we weren't selling it out as gospel. Oh, don't get mad with me, people. <laughs> but remember, spiritual and gospel, they had a different purpose. Mm -hmm. And so 
Even that music was a protest music. You see, that was a music that was telling the social commentary. But we were using the images of the Bible. We were using gods and the symbols of the Bible. We were talking about us. And I wish it. You know, right. hip hop just took it straight to the juggler and talked right. about here and now. This is what's up. Right. Where I live, the economic condition, the political condition, the social condition, the intellectual condition is like this. And here's how I'm going to react to it because right. you haven't given me any other avenue of reactions to take. Right. God, you haven't given me any other avenues of reactions to take. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, um, Chase, like who were your mentors or who are your mentors? Uh, Professor James Smalls. Uh, I, I learned from all the uh, what I call master teachers, uh, Dr. Cobb, Dr. John Henry Clark. I'm just a I'm a straight student of the game. That's all I am, a student. Of course, my father, when it comes to just being a man, you know, he showed me how to be a man at a young age and he was more so. He showed me by example. Mm. You know, I saw him uh, retire my mother when she had my sister at 32. You know, he never said nothing about it, but it was just like this what man do. You know, it's I saw I saw that by example and I was like, oh, man, you know what I'm saying? It's like I, I didn't you know, I didn't ever want for anything growing up. He took care of business. He still take care of the business today. You know, so, of course, my father, as far as, like I say, knowledge go, uh, Dr. Kaba. Dr. Ben, all the ancestors and the elders today, because really, Miss Felicia, I understand and listening to the mentors and the elders that it's about the right now. You know, when we get things done, like Professor Small said, it's the youth. You know, I look at brothers like Fred Hampton. People be telling me I'm young. Fred Hampton was 21. I got to step my game up. And he was unifying games. Jeff Fort with the Black Peace Stone Nation. He was a very young brother. And he really, he only got in trouble when they started changing their name to the El Rukins. And they started mm -hmm. some revolutionary stuff. That's when they got in trouble. You know, Larry Hoover, these were young brothers. Uh, you know, and even when we're going back to the Civil War, the Union soldiers, remember over 180,000 soldiers fought in the Union that were black. They were, Their average age was 25. So they're my age now. So I understand the role that I got to play. And it's, you know, if we're going to make anything shake right now in 2021, it's going to come from my age group. And we got to go because that's what history has shown us. Even going back to in antiquity, you know, Hannibal was like 19 when he took over Rome. These were young brothers who were just, you know what I'm saying, on their purpose, on their spirit and, and trying to get it done. So, you know, I think mentors are very, very important. And uh, the elders might can't get it done physically with the same energy. But if you take that mindset and go in there as a youth with that same energy, we're going to get a lot of done. We're going to get a lot of things done. Man. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I was just as you were talking, um, uh, Dr. Renoko Rashidi is um, is in the house. And, you know, we were just Dr. Uh, Rashidi. Another mentor. Yep. And you were telling you were telling me about his trip because he's taking absolutely. a trip of people to um, to Africa this August. I believe it's August 1st. And right. so, so, you know, while we were talking about Dr. Rashidi and he's in the house, mm -hmm. you know, which uh, that's one of um, Professor Small's. Yeah. Little, well, like, well, I want, I want to shout out to them right now. Right now. Uh, Brother Rashidi, you know, I was talking to Sharifa today, so we're going to unite and we're going to bust it down. Me, you and Dr. J going to be rolling the Africa and Kimmy together. Yo, this is, as long as y'all give happy talks, an uh, interview <laughs> on the hop, we are good. Okay, just yeah. let me know. I'll get my ticket too. But you know, um, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I don't think people understand like the behind scenes and and how all you guys are cool. Like you guys are all cool. You 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 know you work in your respective areas, but it's like the super friends. Everyone has a little special powers, but you guys definitely all come you know to unite. Um, Professor, like, who are your who are your mentors? Oh my God! Like, 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 um, my father. I I didn't. I only met my birth father once when I was four. My father was my stepfather, right? Mm -hmm. He married my mom. Imagine this brother marry a lady with eleven children. That's wow. not his, and raise all of us, right? I remember some mornings when I'd be doing homework and he he had to go to work. He was a carpenter and a bricklayer. 
And so he'd go to work like six o'clock in the morning, five thirty in the morning. But he'd sit up with me to do homework until two o'clock in the mornings. He wouldn't go to sleep until my homework was done. Right. And I remember on his deathbed, he died from cancer so young. Um, I came to see him and he says, um, he knew the hour he would leave. I said, when do you want me to come back tomorrow? He said, uh, be here at three o'clock. Mm-hmm. I was late and he left at three. But he told me the day before, he said, boy, he said, you know, I'm not coming back home. I said, oh, man, you coming back home? You going to be here? He said, nah. He said, but I bought these new underwears. They're Fruit of the Looms, he said. He said, there's a whole box under the bed. You get them. Don't let them other ones get to it first. <laughs> you get that and you take that home. And he said, you go in the closet. He said, I know you're a little taller than me, but I bought some new suits. And I always bought my suits too big. Pick out the one you want. And then he said, I got this nice beige overcoat. And then he said, once you get what you want, take the briefcase. He said, I know you're a businessman. You keep the case, but give all the papers to your mama. And then mm-hmm. she'll know what to do when I'm gone. This, mm-hmm. He on his deathbed, still taking care of me. The day before he died, giving instructions. The most beautiful human being in the world. And my grandpa, my grandma, and my great-grandma, and great-grandpa, those were my first teachers. And my school teacher, who I call every month, my elementary school teacher was 98 years old. We wow. still kick wow. it every month. Ms. Betty wow. Murray from Paula's Island, South Carolina. That's my girl, right? <laughs> um, they propelled me. It was grandma, you know, my great grandpa, my grandma father came from Africa, mm-hmm. you know, and his brother. So I just missed them. I was about two when they died. They both were centurions. Mm-hmm. But my grandma was the first one that told me we were from Africa. Mm. I was about 15, 16, and I was like sailing after that. Yeah. <laughs> I was in another space. And then I met Malcolm that same year. I was 16 years old. I saw him on television, and I told my mom, who had just moved to New York with my father to work to make more money, I wanted to meet this man. And my mom brought me up here to meet Malcolm X. And I met Malcolm X. Wow. Wow. You know? wow. And so the white folks, I went back home to Georgetown, South Carolina, thought I was Malcolm X. So they railroaded my butt in the military mm. the day after graduation. And he was assassinated while I was overseas. Mm. And then I came home, joined his organization. His sister Ella became one of my great teachers. Uh, Haji Sam Jabba, who performed his j- Janaza and his funeral, became one of my great teachers. Camille Badu, uh, Sonny Malik, who was a soldier, Bumpy Johnson and a bodyguard to Malcolm. Um, then Dr. John Henry Clark, I would meet during that same period, Dr. Ben, and then I would meet Dr. Leonard Jeffries, mm-hmm. who was one of the most powerful teachers in the world. Right. Dr. Francis Welsing, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries, Dr. Barbara Sizemore, Dr. James Turner, Dr. Jacob Carruthers. I've lived in heaven. I, I was born into this, back. Dr. Ivan Ben Sertema. I mean, mm-hmm. Dr. Malan. These people are like uncles to us. Right. Local was there on the same journey with me through many of these teachers. Mm-hmm. And so those are the people who formed me, you know. And so I have a responsibility to all of them until I'm no longer here in this body. Right. Because they took their responsibility to black people seriously. Right. You know? And it's look on me. They are me. I'm them. I love yeah. them. They love me. Absolutely. I talk to them like they're still walking around in their bodies right now. Mm-hmm. And that's when we look at Chase, that's them come back. Right. There's Dr. Clark up in there. There's some Dr. Ben up in there. There's some right. Ben Sertim up in there. There's some Absolutely. up in there. That's them come back. Mm-hmm. You know? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, gosh. <laughs> You know, you got to just take a deep breath for a minute. Um, so, um, all right. Um, God, you know what, um, Professor, that's it was really nice what you said about your dad. You know, I was thinking when you were talking about him, I was thinking about my father who's no longer here. He's, he's transitioned. But, yeah, you know, people need their daddies. Definitely. Right. Um, so, so now... You know, we talked a lot about, um, you know, our mentors and 
and you know what's and what's and, you know what we need to like make it work. So what are some things when we're looking at each group? Um, and we'll start with you, Chase. Like, what are some things that you think the elderly folks can maybe do more of, or do some, or do better? Um, as far as the elders, I would say, um, pretty much is. Let me see how to say this. I would like to see more elders speaking the language of the student. Times have evolved, and speak speak in the sense of, you know, we might convey our message kind of raw sometimes as a younger generation because now we have hip hop we have different things so i would love to see more elders listen to those messages and be willing to have conversations and like i say to me the best teachers like professor smalls i feel like professor smalls can speak in any language if you were uh, if you a man coming from the streets he can speak to you in a street type of way you know where you understand and you can convey it if you're coming from a scholarly world or you're coming from a corporate sense he can speak to you in a certain type of way and yeah. to me, those are the best teachers. So I would like to see the elders uh, basically speak in the language of the student a little bit more, because oftentimes as students, we only know one language. We're not diverse mentally where we know how to talk about, uh, you know, different things, economics or so. We, we you know, sometimes you got to meet us at the low point and, and bring us up, you know, so I would love to see more elders do that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, professor. Uh, what, what, what do you think about that? What do you what do you think uh, yeah. younger folks can do better? Yeah, I agree with Chase 100 percent. I call it going back home, you know, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. why I love Leonard Jeffries. He do a lot of that. Doug J, mm -hmm. um, he go where the young people are. Sometimes right. I don't want him to do all this. I want him to take a break, mm -hmm. you know, but <laughs> we got to go to our young, mm -hmm. even if we just sit there and listen, you know. Just sit there and listen. Just let them see our face. Mm -hmm. I first learned about Sonetta and Sonetta TV. Right. None of them didn't know me. So I'd slip into the National Black Theater and just sit up in the back. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of scared of these youngsters. So I'd go packing a friend, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was kind of a friend, you know? Because I'm saying, oh, they say they're crazy. So, but I'm going <laughs> up in here. And, and then we started to get together and 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 i started walking so you know there's too much conflicts and i remember me and bambata uh got with some of the brothers who was having these big fights and we got in the room and said okay we're gonna cool out this conflict mm -hmm. you know i'm gonna be a mediator and then we know who the heck is this dude and and i just go like i'm just one of the elders i'm coming i don't know what to do but i'm gonna come and hang with y'all and i'm gonna fight with y'all and I'm gonna be with y'all, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know? And um, sometimes just be there, just go and listen to the youngsters, That's listen true. to what they're saying. They're saying the same things we're saying just in their way. Yeah. Um, they're confronting the same ills, economically, politically, and culturally, the same police brutality, the same racism that we did. But they've got some new weapons we didn't have. Right. You know? And they know how to use them better than we do. Right. And we need to go and, and sit with them and say, okay, we don't know how to use that weapon, but we got some information, the, the ammunition that you could put up in that weapon. Right. Absolutely. You know? Right. I think more of that has to happen. Um, more of the events that our young people are doing around the country, us older brothers and sisters, let's go and attend those events. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to agree with what they're saying or how they're saying it. That's that's the that's the that's the future we talk about, which is right now. Right. You know, this is the right now. And right. it's going to be too late if we don't go sit with them now. Mm -hmm. Let's go sit with them. Because the one thing I found when I went among, started going to all these events, the young people love us, man. They love us. <laughs> yes, indeed. And they protect me. Yeah. I don't have to carry my gun no more. Yeah. <laughs> <To show. laughs> Go up by myself, drive a little car, you know, a little lift of beast, whatever I'm driving. And um, I go in there and you treat it like a god, mm -hmm. all babies. And then you listen to them, like we look at Chase and goes, oh my God, mm -hmm. there's a God having a human experience. Absolutely. You know, there are hundreds of ancestors come back in this one body to say, express yourself. Mm -hmm. You know? 
And so Absolutely. we just need to take every opportunity to come together, whether it's on the mediums that we're using today, or if we can do it in person as the situation changes, we could do it more in person. Like I just had some surgery and I'm really tired, right? Because you know, your body's patching itself up and right. you know, the same energy. But Sonetta called me yesterday and there's some young sisters who just, I forgot the name, do a round table thing. And he said, David, just love to have you on the show. And I go, son, that I'm tired. I'm doing this thing. I said, but happy tomorrow. But after that, I need a rest. But before I went to sleep last night, I had to call and say, look, tell them sisters, call me tomorrow by 12 o'clock. So they called the day. And I told them, I will be on the show with you tomorrow night. Just tell me what I need to do. I'll follow your lead. Because these young sisters reaching out to us, if we can't do nothing but answer their questions, then let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, it, let me tell you, you know, I don't know about y'all, but what COVID has done has given us more access to right. elders. Yeah. You guys are, every, it, it's amazing the amount of energy you have because, mm -hmm. you know, I was telling Chase that when um, when Taiki was making making Hoppy, you know, he would call you guys all different times of the, of the day, whenever mm -hmm. you guys would just get suited up, meet him someplace in the city and shoot something. But it's like now that COVID has happened, it's like 24 hours because you're not just only on here in the United States, you know, yeah. you're over in Africa too. So it's like your day is like almost 20, like 22 hours. You're in the UK, yeah. you're like everywhere, you know, and it's, you know, uh, um, Dr. Jeffries, he's every place. So, you know, we really, I just wanted to say thank you for just allowing us to um, be able to listen to you guys. Mm -hmm. for you guys to keep saying yes, you know, well, that's, Absolutely. The thing I want to say to Chase is that one, we love you. Two, that's what you, likewise. you belong to us. Mm -hmm. And three, feel free to find any of us. Find out how to reach Baba Renoka Rashidi from uh, Felicia. Find out how to reach Dr. Jeffries. Take the initiative, call him, say, My mm -hmm. name is Brother Chase, so and so and so. Got your number from Brother Small or Sister Felicia or from Baba Renoko, or from mm -hmm. Baba Wade Nobles. And, and I just need to talk to y'all about something. I need you to give me some ideas. And that, that's what you do. Because this whole thing is about apprenticing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I hate to use that word because Trump done messed up the concept. Right, right, right. I got you. I got you. I, I know what you're saying. I got right. you. But I was somebody's apprentice, you know. Right. Um, I remember I was doing a speech in Washington. I didn't know. And this is the first time the big brothers invited me to speak. And I was on the train with Baba Ivan Van Sertima. He got on when we got when I got into Jersey on the Amtrak. And I told him, I said, Baba, I don't know what to do. I was scared to death. Right. And he sat there with me all the way to DC about three and a half hours and helped me put together a speech that made me look like I was one of the big <laughs> brothers. <you know? laughs> that was the first speech I did with Anasa and Dr. Jeffries and the best. Mm -hmm. So, but, but if I was too afraid to ask that elder to help right. me, you know, and that kind of propelled me to where others start calling me to come and give lectures. But that was the first time I gave, I think it was a, something that their um asa hilly was having one of his educational conference mm -hmm. and i was talking about uh the politics of the day how, mm -hmm. how we integrate education and politics uh, of that day i think i still got mm -hmm. those notes um but dr ben sertima took away the fear mm -hmm. he showed me that i could do it i didn't yeah. even know how to write a paper to give a speech, I could write a paper to give to my teacher, but mm -hmm. I didn't know how to do one to make a speech wow. with all these big giants, right? Yeah. Um, and he showed me like, just tell the truth, get your information together and just tell your truth. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. works and that's how I do things to, today. Yeah. Um, so reach out to the elders some, oh, yeah. sometimes, because sometimes we don't know how to reach out to the young people. Right. We don't have the connections, you know? Right. And so um, we need to we, just remember that Luke or me, no matter what, Absolutely. whether you speak Spanish, Absolutely. you're black, you belong to me. You speak mm -hmm. Portuguese, you belong to me. You speak French, you belong to me. You speak Creole, you belong to me. You speak English, Anglo, 
you belong to me. That's mm -hmm. what we gotta remember. Mm -hmm. We are the African. It don't mm -hmm. matter where we are in the world. Mm -hmm. No matter where we the Aborigine or the Biborigine or what Origine, we are the African. We are the original source. When God decided mm -hmm. it was going to manifest as a human and manifest as an African woman first and then an African man, and they hooked up. Right. This is the history of creation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I say, the, the, the feeling is, is likewise. You know, we love Professor James Smalls, and I think oftentimes the elders get a bad rap because as the youngsters, we listen to the white media too much. And like I said, the white media props up certain elders that are against the youngsters. Right. So we don't we don't hear the Professor James Smalls on a mainstream level. You have to come to certain channels and those channels are far and few in between, you know. So oftentimes, like I said, we don't hear from the elders that support our message and who are riding with us. So that's that's very important. That's why I'm, I'm blessed to have platforms like this, like Happy Talks. Oh, that's what's up. You know, we can't even we can't even do it without you guys. That's yeah. the other thing. You know, we all need each other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you guys have. Been, I mean, you 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 really answered all the questions that I had um, mm -hmm. in terms of um, you know um, of all the major things. I do have a question for for both of you guys. Mm -hmm. um, what what gives you hope? in the other for the future like like uh chase what gives you hope in the elders in terms of how we're looking at the future um i think understanding that the elders will always be back around that we are our ancestors so we never we never really go anywhere you know that's the big thing you know professor james Smalls talks about you know not fearing death i am my ancestors i'm a i'm a talk truth to power i'm not afraid of of leaving this earth, you know, and the same thing with the elders, the elders will be back around. You will become the elder at one point in time. This whole cycle is just going to continue. You know, that baton, as long as we keep uh, passing that baton, that's what gives me hope, you know, that it's like, it's not over until we win. You know, Dr. Kaba teaches us this. It's not over until we win. He says that all the time. Yeah. So we're going to keep passing that baton. You know, we're going to keep moving. We're going to keep speaking truth to power. You know, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Professor, what gives you hope in, in the future with the young folks? Chase, no. if everything else in the world had gone bad <laughs> and I met you on that phone last night, my right. world is now good. I appreciate Chase it. Gives me hope. Oh, he tells me we are eternal. Right. You know, you know. Oh, God. Oh, my God. I'll tell you, oh, I can't. <laughs> this is really nice. Um, One thing I want to ask Chase, though, how mm -hmm. did you arrive at choosing the title for the book? Uh, I would uh, I always tell people I would find myself in a, a, a stuck position, you know, kind of like a brain freeze position where I'm exhausting mm -hmm. myself. I can't find anything to really speak about anymore. Or I'm looking for a particular topic to talk about. And I would always say the ancestor, the ancestor within would give me a voice. You know, he would give me a voice and that's why I named it Voice of the Ancestor. So when I would run out of information or I was looking for a source, I would run across a, a, a Dr. Renaud Rashidi's book, you know, and I'm like, oh, man, this is what I needed. You know, the ancestors will always guide me in the right direction when I was looking for certain things. I remember when I was looking for the black presence in America before the slave trade and I would you know, a certain image will pop up. You know, I would be passing through, I remember passing through Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and just happenstance, look up the name, the name meant Black Warrior. You know, the ancestors were talking to me like, you you right here, You, our presence is right here. Mm -hmm. You know, what you're looking for is right here. So I named it Voice of the Ancestors because every time I was stuck, every time I was looking for an answer, you know, I feel like those ancestral voices would come to me that, that have been here forever, you know? So that's where I got the name from. Listen, you, you're orbiting, son. You out there yeah. <laughs> with those ancestors, you and the world, and, and Garby talked about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And he has three volumes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, um, I hope one of you guys are like the, the lucky five people. But if not, I put his, um, the 
the actual link. So you can just click it and go straight to his um, store and pick them all up. You can get like a bundle and get all three. He has a bunch of stuff on there. You guys just go, please support this brother so he can keep on writing. You know, it's so important for when people are doing the work. Sometimes there's so much work to be done. And sometimes we can't do every single thing, you know, right. but you're, you know, contributing your funds or your resources to, you know, different people doing different things. This is how everything gets done. You know, right. what did you say last night, um, Professor, about each little piece? Wait, because you know, I took notes. Yeah, you really got to remind me. None of us got the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But when we when we put the, each little piece that we are together, then we come up with that whole. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yes. I loved uh, what Chase said earlier when he was talking about he realized how much it is that he doesn't know or how much there is yet to be learned. Right, right. One, one of, that was one of the greatest things I got. It was from one of my um my martial arts uh teacher back in the day and he had a sign up over the door he said when you walk in this door remember not to be caught up in the i know but how mm -hmm. much is to know mm -hmm. right right yeah absolutely. And, and i think uh i think it's important that like i said we uh miss felicia i'm gonna continue to carry that baton and and build on that, you know, build on the progress. I told you, and I would like to announce here that in yes. December, we're coming out with uh, the 1000 amazing facts about the Negro. That's going to be a sequel to J.A. Rogers. That's something oh, okay. that was a, a very influential book on me. And I and I read that book and I was like, I read it somewhat conscious already, but I was like, man, it's so many more facts we can add to this. And, you know, so I want to do a, a 1000 amazing facts about the Negro that's set to come out in December. And, you know, that's just some of the things, like I said, we want to continue to pass that baton. And hopefully after me, uh, a descendant of mine, to write the 2,000 to 5,000 amazing facts about the Negro. And we continue to piece that story back together because all history is our history, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's why I know that's where my hope comes from. Uh, yes, you know? yes. And he's yeah. not in the future. He's in the present. Mm -hmm. He's in the present. Yes. Um, you know, we want to thank everybody for contributing. And there's some people who contributed on Cash App. Um, Ava, um, Raymond McGee. Wait, is Raymond uh, McGee? Um, that's my father, my mentor. Oh, my daddy. Of course, my father's going to support. Oh, that's what's up. And, and, um, and B Mac. Go ahead, Mr. McGee. That's what's, uh, oh my God. You know what? I can't even take, I'm about to start getting damn tissue when I'm still. Oh, oh, man. This is, I listen, oh my God. It's no love like daddy's love. Come on. Mama's man. all right too, but I'm telling you, them daddies, y'all right. just don't know. Every man, balance. yes, every the man balance. that is listening right now, all you right. guys are so wanted and you are needed because, you know, it's, it's right. just daddy, yeah. daddy's all right. And I feel like that's the, uh, you know, Professor Small says all the time, that's the original trinity, you know, the mother, the father, and the child, you know. So yes. that's, the part, that's the oldest symbol of trinity, you know. Yes, yes. Oh, that's what's up. Um, okay, guys, oh, this is wonderful. Um, so, listen, you always can come back, Chase, especially when you think there's 1,000 um, facts, like, yo. Oh, yeah, you we gotta come back. back. We yeah, come you come back before then. You know, there's a of lot course. of months between December, so I want you to know that this is your home. Mm -hmm. And Professor, I tell you, love some Professor. I saw somebody in this little chat saying, I talk to him every day. I was like, okay. <laughs> I want Chase, right. I'll call Chase tomorrow, and then I'm going to hook you up with my sister, Portland, okay. down in D.C., so okay. we can put your books on our page. Okay. Our page. Yeah. Okay. We'll do yeah. Well, yes, we, we got a good number of people, and that, and and they'll they they'll they'll move with you. Absolutely, yes. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, and we are yeah we're gonna um we do a buy black every Friday on our mm -hmm. um, on all our social media platforms, and so tomorrow we will have um Chase's um he's our buy black person. So I'm make sure because we got support black businesses. Happy principle number three support black businesses. And so um, please support this brother because this is when we're talking about, you know, oh, the young people, young people, this is the young man right here. And so let's support him so he can keep doing what he's doing. All right. 
Thank you, guys. No, let me knock some little stuff on our religious brothers and sisters. Remember, Moses was a young chase one day. Mm. Jesus mm. was a young chase one day. Muhammad was a young chase one day. Umar was a young chase one day. Aramula was a young chase one day. Okay. Oshun was a young chase one day. If we understand that, the youth is when empires get built because Chase was talking about them having that energy. Us elders, we simply pass through the information for you to form with your energy and recreate the tomorrows that become the blueprint for your yesterday in the present time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, guys, right there. There's this IG, um, Voice of the Ancestors. It's a huge platform on IG. He puts out videos all the time, and you'll see yeah. Professor Small in the videos a lot. Um, all of our elders. Thank you both. Um, and um, I'm just gonna put you guys in the green green room for a moment. Talk okay. to everybody and be be right back with you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Felicia. Thank you, dear. Yay. Okay, guys. Um, listen, I thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Please like this video, share this video with three people. All right. Share the video with three people so that um, you know, we can get everybody, you know, looking at this right here because this is monumental. Okay, young and old, right here at Hoppy. Um, please go to our website right here. We got the new um, Hoppy DVD. Look at that gold, because we gold. Look at the gold. Look at the gold, guys. And thank you guys for all of the contributions, because they go to people like Chase. They go to watching webinars um, with um, Dr. Renoko Rashidi. They go to helping Anthony Browder um, dig in, um, in Egypt. So please contribute, um, and thank you guys um, so much. Um, get the DVD copy. Happy film, sign up for that newsletter. It's very, very super important. All right. So I hope you guys have a beautiful weekend and a better next week. All right. Peace. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?